If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask if you would to turn with me to Psalm chapter 30. Psalm chapter 30. We've all heard the Christmas story, and we know that the angels appeared to these shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. I wonder how many of us this morning are joyful. Do you have joy in your life today? I have a feeling a lot of us don't really think about it, or maybe we don't have it at all. We don't have that joy that's in our life. And before we can understand what joy is, according to the Bible, we've got to understand what joy is not. Joy is not that momentary happiness that we have when we open our Christmas gift and find that new PlayStation 5. Because that, that fades away pretty quickly, doesn't it? See, joy is much deeper than that. As a matter of fact, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It has an enduring comfort in your soul. It's an attitude of your heart and of your spirit. It's determined by your confidence in God and His love for you. It is the byproduct of having that strong, intimate relationship with Christ. Now, can you lose your joy? Can things steal your joy? Yes. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, how to have that joy restored. Because too often times we let life circumstances and situations steal the joy that God has for us. And in Psalm chapter 30, verses 4 through 5, it says these words. It says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning you see joy is the recognition that no matter what we are going through we can still have contentment and we can still have peace in our hearts notice what it says in psalms chapter 30 verse 4 it says saying praises to the lord O ye saints and give thanks to his holy name you see today i'm trying to ask you to do something i want you to really do it i want you to try it I want you today to praise God. Just praise Him for a moment, no matter whether life is good or whether life is bad. And I know for some of you right now, you're going through crisis in your life. You're going through trials in your life. You're going through struggles. Maybe you're going through financial struggles or maybe you're going through marital struggles or relational struggles or maybe you're going through struggles with addictions or other things. But for just the moment, for right now, just pause for a moment and truly just whisper the words, praise you, Jesus. No matter whether life is good or life is bad. And I'm not asking you really about your circumstances or your situations. I'm asking you to praise God even in the midst of the storm and in the midst of the crisis. And you know, I think a lot of times we don't want to praise God because we don't feel worthy, you know. We don't feel uh, that we feel unloved or we feel unhappy. And the reason... We base our faith or our feeling of joy upon a feeling and not upon God's character and upon God's word. The Bible says it this way in Isaiah 49. I think it applies to a lot of us today. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 49, 13 and 15, it says, Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion, I'm going to replace the word Zion with the church. But the church said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can't a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. You see, today, if you need joy, it begins with the knowledge that I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. God has not forgotten you. God knows exactly what you're going through. God knows exactly where you've been. And God has for not forgotten you even though you may think he has. He is not. He cannot forget you. And so today you can shout with joy. And you notice that shout with joy was before the deliverance, not after. They begin to praise God before the deliverance began. So today begin with praise. 
Because the fact is, even though Psalm 30, 30 verse 5 says, for his anger is for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Man, we make choices. We do things. And, and sometimes the, because of our choices, the consequences seem too much to bear. I remember it wasn't all that long ago when uh, I had been a pastor of a pretty good-sized church, you know, one of the biggest, well, it was the biggest at the time in the county. And then I fell, and I can remember uh, spending the holiday season about like this right here in jail. And I remember as I was in that jail cell thinking, man, I went from preacher to prisoner and how far I had fallen. And man, I was miserable. And I thought, how could God possibly love me after all I've done? How could God possibly care about me now? But see, what I didn't understand was what this verse is saying. Even though I was paying the consequences for my choices, and even though it seemed that God was angry at me, the Bible says his favor, his grace, lasts forever. You see, I don't care what you're going through right now. I don't care about your circumstance or your situation. God's not forgotten you. And the fact is, as though there's weeping right now, joy is going to come. Joy is coming in the morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 through 11 puts it this way. It says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you, forgot, have you completely forgotten his word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They discipline us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. But painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You see, God will allow us to go through these trials, these consequences of our choices, these circumstances and situations. But God is still in control. God still loves us. And even though we sometimes feel disciplined by God or that we've made God angry, God's grace is going to bring us through. I think of the prodigal son. He made some bad choices along the way, didn't he? I mean, he uh, chose to in get his inheritance before his father had died. He took his inheritance. He traveled to a far country. The Bible says while he's in that far country, he spent all of his inheritance on riotous living. And that word riotous actually means ruinous. It's like a tomato being plucked from the vine and drying up in the sun. And so what he did was he spent all of his inheritance. He spent everything he had. But he was a young man, good looking. He thought, well, I'll just make some more money. I can make it all back. But what he didn't know is a great depression, a famine was going to come across the land. And the Bible says he began to be at want. And like most of us who are addicts or most of us who are alcoholics, you have a lot of friends when you got the money, when you got the drugs, when you got the beer. But all of a sudden when that dries up, your friends dry up. See it all the time. Hear it all the time. And so the Bible says that at that point, when this famine hit, these are exact words, and no man gave unto him anything. He was abandoned. And so what he did is something that a good Jewish boy would never do. He went and hung out with some pigs. He, he uh, attached himself to a pig farmer, and he was allowed to feed the pigs. And what happened was he was so hungry at this time, he would look at that slop he was feeding those pigs, and he wanted to eat it. But the problem was that the husk of the, of the crop, or the, the slop, he couldn't digest. And so he would look at that slop, and he would, he would feign to just eat that, you know? But there's a turning point in this passage. And the turning point in the prodigal son comes in the, in the, in the phrase in uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 17, 
it says in the NIV, he came to his senses. In the King James Bible, it says he came to himself. There was a certain point that all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. Maybe after feeding those pigs, he decided to wash his face in the watering trough. But whatever happened, maybe he saw his reflection in that water. But something happened that all of a sudden he said, look at me. Look where I've been. Look where I am. I'm now feeding pigs and my father's servants. His slaves have, have food on the table. They got things they can eat. But look at me. I'm a son and I'm hungry. And he came to his senses. And so he thought to himself, I'm going to go home to my father. I'm not worthy to be a son. I failed. I, I've blown it. But I'm going to go home to my father. And I'm just going to beg him to just let me be one of his hired servants. And so the young boy, he pulls himself up out of that pig pen. I can imagine him climbing that fence and beginning that long journey home. Every step he's taking, I'm sure he's rehearsing his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Just God make me a hired servant. Just, just let me live with you, daddy. And all the way home, he's rehearsing that speech. And the old man, the old father, looks down the road one day, and he sees that son now coming home. He's not the cocky little boy that went away with all that money. He's now broken and beaten, making his way home down that dirt road. And the daddy looks up and he looks at him, sees him coming. But he doesn't wait till he gets there. Instead, the father begins to run. He begins to run. And when he gets to his son, the son collapses in front of his father. He says, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm not worthy to have your name. Just let me be a hired servant. Just let me live here. The father reaches down and says, Son, my son, you were dead. And you're alive again. You were lost, and now you're found. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's put ro a robe on his body. Let's put rings on his fingers, and let's celebrate. You see, that's how God feels about you. That's how God the Father feels about you. You know what God, you know what that father did? I want you to notice something that father, the prodigal son, never did. He never went to the pig pen to get his son, did he? You want to wallow with the pigs, God's going to let you wallow with the pigs. You're going to pay the price, but you can wallow with the pigs. You can hang out in that pig pen, but one day when you get hungry, one day when you go, you know what? I, when you come to your senses, you can climb out of that pig pen, and you can begin that walk home. And when you begin that walk home, let me tell you what God the Father is going to do. God the Father is going to run down that road to meet you. God hadn't given up on you, friend. God has not given up on you. And that's where we can get our joy. Throughout the Psalms, joy is a response not to circumstances or situations, but it's a response to God's character of who God is. The book of, the book of Acts chapter 16 is one of my favorite stories. It's just I love the story of Paul and Silas and how they were traveling and this little old girl was chasing after them and, and she was, uh, you know, yelling things. These men are the most are from the most high God. And, and, and Paul recognized that she had an evil spirit, so he cast out this demon. Well, what Paul, I guess, maybe didn't know or maybe he did was there were some men in that community that made a lot of money off this little girl because this little girl had some kind of demon that could help her predict the future. And so these men were making money. Well, they ended up stirring up the town, and they had Paul and Silas arrested. Well, they were beaten very badly. As a matter of fact, the, the kind of beatings they went through sometimes caused death. They were beaten very badly, and then they were thrown into jail in the town of Philippi. And while they were in jail, they were shackled. And a Philippian jailer guarded them with his life, because if these men escaped, the Philippian jailer w could be murdered or, or killed for letting them escape so here was Paul and Silas beaten their backs bloodied and bruised their face bloodied and bruised shackled in chains sitting in a jail for what for delivering a little girl and what did they do did they feel sorry for themselves I think most of us would did they say God I'll never do anything for you again after that 
God, I was just trying to do the right thing. And look where it wound up. Look where I wound up. God, how could you do this to me? Have you ever asked that question? God, how could you do this to me? God, how could you allow this to happen if you really love me? But that's not what Paul and Silas did. Instead, they began to sing. They began to sing praises to God. And as they began to sing praises to God, the Bible says that the earth began to shake. And it shook so hard that the chains fell off all the prisoners that were in that jail. And not only that, but the jail doors opened. Now, the Philippian jailer, he just knew what would have happened. I mean, after all, he, the, he felt the earthquake. He knew the doors of the jail were open. And he knew that now he was going to face death because all of his prisoners had escaped. And so he took his own sword out and he was about to take his own life before the Romans took it for him. And as he was about to fall on his sword, he heard this voice from the back of the darkness in that jail cell. said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Wow. How many of us would have ran? How many of us would have ran? The door was open. But instead, Paul and Silas trusted God. They had their chance for payback. He was their enemy. He put them in chains. He didn't bother to tend their wounds. He was a hater. But Paul and Silas were Jesus lovers. Paul and Silas knew that Jesus says, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. You see, Paul and Silas not only knew the gospel, they lived the gospel. And so the jailer calls for the lights and he rushes in. And trembling before Paul and Silas, he falls to his knees and he said, what must I do to be saved? You see, I'm sure that Philippian jailer, he heard the sermons of Paul and Silas. He heard the praise of Paul and Silas. He heard the testimonies. But now he had met real Christians who put their actions in front of their mouth they lived the gospel and didn't just preach the gospel and because of Paul and Silas praising God in the midst of the storm a man and his family were saved not only that but a man and his family were saved and started a church in Philippi not only that but because of that church that was started in Philippi the book of Philippians was written where Paul wrote a book or a letter to that church and throughout that book of Philippians is a resounding theme you can't miss it because it said over and over and over again rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice Paul knew the secret of joy was that intimate relationship and trust that we put in God it's not a request but it's a command how can we have joy when we're hurting how can we have joy in the middle of all the pain now one of my favorite movies I, I, I will guarantee you if we were playing the newlywed game and the question was asked what's your husband's favorite movie to Deb if she thought for a moment she'd know what it is it's a wonderful life we'll watch it every Christmas no it's not Rocky 3 even though that's good even though it's good um it's a wonderful life. How many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? If you have, you need to watch it, man. You need to watch It's a Wonderful Life. I watch it every year. You know? and, and, and my kids always say, you know, don't make me watch this again. Well, I don't care. I'm, you, you need to sit there and watch it with me, you know. And, and the funny thing about it is I've watched this thing, I, I, no kidding, at least 15 times or more. I've watched from beginning to end It's a Wonderful Life. And you know what? I cry every time. I do. I mean, Deb hates it when I cry. I do. I cry, man. I, like, my tears be rubbing. They'll be asking me questions. I do, you know. Because, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's so bad. With the, it, I, George takes responsibility for Uncle Billy's stupidness, doesn't he? I mean, George takes responsibility. He's always trying to be a good guy, and yet Uncle Billy's always a goofy drunk. And Uncle Billy loses the money, and George about to face prison, you know, on Christmas Eve. And, and your heart just goes out to him, you know, and he, and he wishes he had never been born. And then an angel comes. Well, I ain't going to tell you the whole story because I want you to go home and watch it. But I always know that when, when Mr. Potter 
is so evil and so mean and I can't stand that joker. I still have a little joy in my heart because you know what? I know how it's going to end. You see, I know at the end what's going to happen. See, if you're watching the show for the first time with me, I'm happy because I know how it's going to end and you don't. You already all mad at, Uncle, at Mr. Potter and Uncle Billy. And I understand that because I'm, I'm that way too. But you see, I know how it's going to end. We can have joy because we know how it's going to end. And though there may be weeping at night, there may be weeping right now. Joy is going to come in the morning. It's coming. You can shout already because it's coming. And that's not based upon what I think that's based upon God's character, that's based upon God's word. Romans 8, 28 says it this way in 20, through 32. And we know that in all things, in all things, in all things, God works for the good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And he also predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Let me tell you what, folks. I don't care what you're going through this morning. And I know some of you are going through some hard times. I know you are. Some of you lost loved ones this year. Some of you have lost loved ones recently. Some of you struggled this year with your marriage. Some of you struggled financially. Some of you struggled, like I said, with addiction. Some of you struggled with so many things this year. Some of you, you put on this face, but inside you hurt, man. You pretend like you're not, but you are. It's been a hard year for some folks in this room been a hard year but you can have joy in knowing God's got this God's got this but you got to let it go now you got to let him have it you see sometimes like I said last week sometimes God's hot, God has to pry it out of my hands but God's got it let it go no matter what you're going through God's going to use it for his glory he's going to use it to teach you He's going to use it for you to be empathetic to others. He's going to use it as a testimony. Then one day you're going to be able to stand up here. Who would have thought when I was in that jail cell years ago? I wouldn't have. Who would have thought? Then just a few years later, I'll be a pastor of a church again. That God would restore, begin to restore to my life what the locusts have eaten. Folks, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in one day. It took work. It took, it took me learning. It took me submitting. It took me getting under people and, 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 and trusting them and trusting God. It took me a long time to get where I am today. But joy comes in the morning. God's not done. You may be weeping at night, but it's coming. It's coming. The morning is coming. And in that I take hope. And in that is my joy place. Don't let the world and circumstances, situations, and people rob you of your joy today. For 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you trust him and believe in him. And you are filled with unspeakable joy. Man, man, you can praise God today. Even though life is hard. God is good. God is good. And today I'm asking you to look beyond your circumstances and place your faith and trust that God loves you. And sometimes that's hard because you don't feel like you should be loved. You want to punish yourself. You want to beat yourself because of what you've done. But let me say this to you folks who want to punish yourself and beat yourself. The Bible says that Jesus already took your punishment. He's already took your punishment. He's already took your sin. He's already took your disobedience. He's already took all that garbage that you brought that you want to beat yourself up with. And he took it and he took it upon the cross. 
of Calvary. And there he was nailed to that cross and there he bled and he died. So quit trying to punish yourself because Jesus has already taken your punishment for you. You are free today. You are free. You are pardoned by his grace. Don't beat yourself up anymore. You put the past in the past and you move on with God. Let it go and let God. Let it go and let God. Shout for joy today because God's got you. He's not done. He's not done. He's going to take you all the way home. All the way home. I'm a living example of that. And I have joy in my heart today that no matter what life throws at me, God's got it. God's got it. I'm going to ask you to stand with me.